It's my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, introduce uh, Patrick Fulvain to you. He's a behavioral biologist. Um, he studies apes, monkeys. He's got a company called Ape Management, but it's geared towards people. Um, I'm not going to tell you any more than this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let this guy do his own thing with you. Um, enjoy him very much. I've already had a talk with him. He'll move you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas, for giving me also some perspective this morning on uh, project management. Um, it's for me very clear. You think that you have a very dangerous job because I heard you talking about cycling in hell. Uh, I heard you saying a few times getting pissed off. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really a serious job you have. But, um, a little bit to compare. I never get pissed off, uh, only I get pissed over a few times a year and get shit to my head. And that's not shit you think about, it's real chimpanzee poop. Um, um, one of my last projects I managed uh, was building a chimpanzee enclosure for the very simple reason because one of our interns lost his testicles. So if you think you have a difficult job, I would like to invite you into my environment to learn about behavior. But don't worry, I have still my testicles, I still have my fingers, and the only worries is always have a clean shirt. Uh, maybe I should bring a few things in perspective before you think, who is that crazy guy? Um, Patrick van Veen, I'm a behavioral biologist. Uh, I studied biology in Utrecht, um, what is it, 30 years ago. Um, but the problem was I couldn't find a job as a biologist, so I had to figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, and finally I found a job uh, at an insurance company. It had nothing to do, of course, with biology, but I thought, okay, this is the place where I'm going to make a career, because biology doesn't work. And it was a very challenging period, because it was a period of a lot of change. Uh, merging of the company, uh, uh, changes in law, uh, but also the IT, which was changing. If I now uh, teach uh, at a university and I have a group of students in front of me, uh, they are slightly younger as this group, but if I talk to students about a period we didn't have internet, we didn't have email, you see students looking at you as, as if you are a fossil or a dinosaur. And I try to explain to them, that's not that long ago, but for me, the interesting thing was all these changes did something with the behavior of my colleagues. Of course, also with my behavior, but I didn't see it. So there was a moment I thought, okay, what did I study? Um, what I'm advocating for, and that's observing. That was the reason I bought a small notebook like this one, and started to take notes of the behavior of my colleagues. And it was very interesting to see what people did in a changing world. Um, and I think that was also the first moment I started to be convinced that a human factor is essential in an organization, is essential also in projects. Um, I got a new manager, and, and one day he asked me, okay, what are you always doing with a notebook? I explained it to him, and that was the end of my career in the insurance company. Uh, so I had to figure out what we were going to do with my next stage of life, so I wrote my first book, which was started to help my boss as a gorilla, and that was for me uh, the motivation to go to the zoo primate park up and up in the Netherlands where we started 14 years ago to take people into the zoo. And these are my new colleagues, or were my new colleagues. This was, for example, Bongo, silverback gorilla. Uh, he was my, actually, he was my first colleague. A very short story about Bongo. Uh, maybe one less, uh, sorry, uh, I think can I say that to Thomas or not say that? Uh, I say to you, Thomas, you look like a silverback gorilla, but you should behave like a silverback gorilla. If these people should shut up and listen to you, you really should behave different like with these ding ding things. Uh, uh, just behave like a gorilla. Uh, and one of the issues is uh, uh, that, that, that Bongo, well, I, I had the idea about leadership trainings in the zoo, and that came into a newspaper, and we got our first customer. And this first customer, that was uh, 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 11 army officers. 
And one of them uh, was working on leadership uh, uh, training, and uh, he had planned this training in the zoo with us, but he hadn't told his 10 colleagues what they were going to do. So in the morning, a small green minivan arrived at the zoo entrance, and uh, uh, one person was very enthusiastic, but 10 people said, this is not what we are going to do. We are not going into the yeah. zoo to learn about leadership. And we started to discuss. And then we have in the Netherlands a very magical word. If you have a discussion, you're not going to solve. You always can use that word. And it's very simple. It's coffee. And I said to them, OK, let us stop this discussion. Let us first have a cup of coffee, and then we continue. So that's what we did. And we went into the zoo. We have a terrace that was looking over the Gorilla Island, 9 o'clock in the morning. And I gave these officers a cup of coffee. And what you don't need to learn to officers is how they should stand powerful. So what happened is 11 officers stood like that with a mug of coffee, staring over the island, lined up, not communicating with each other, and just staring over the island. And that moment, Bongo showed up. And Bongo saw these 11 men standing there, staring over his island, and he got crazy, he got nuts. So I said, this is my island, this is my area. He started to throw sticks, he started to throw stones, and these 11 officers said, exactly, this is leadership. This is what we want to learn about. And we're completely convinced that this was the perfect training for them. And we had to manage a little bit expectations that day, because that's not all about leadership. So that's how it helped us. I will not introduce all my colleagues. This is only Jim. Jill is interesting, because uh, Jill is a bonobo female. Who of you knows anything about bonobos? What do you know? Yeah, it's a child uh, uh, where bonobos are uh, in the, uh, the, the role as um, nice, uh, social, and talkable. Yeah, in a book where, where bonobos are nice, social, talkable. You mean that they solve everything with sex? Because that's their social media. Oh, no, no, no. That's actually what I do. Yeah, it's written for children. Yeah, we, we avoid the sex work with children. But actually, that's, that's what they do. It's really funny, because I spend a lot of hours in the zoo. And it's really funny when you observe parents coming with a children in the morning at 10 o'clock. And one of the first apes you see in Apno are the bonobos. And, and then the bonobos get outside at 10 o'clock, they get excited. So the first thing they have is a quickie. Okay? You need to have sex with everybody. And then you see parents looking at them and say, OK, we go to the gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe is still staring and showing us what's going on. And it's really funny. If, if you, for example, I, I had the opportunity to observe, I think it's already six years ago, the merging of three bonobo groups, and it's really funny to see how it happens. In the morning at 9 o'clock, the sliding doors open, the three groups are, mixed, are merged, and that is just four hours, one orgy. And after four hours, the merging is finished. No problems anymore. That's perfect in an orgy. But it's really interesting how the bonobo groups are finished. Yes. Then you have, again, hashtag me do or something that you I want to. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I don't understand why people complain why they are screwed by the boss. Uh, uh, for bonobos, that will be very simple. Maybe there is one difference between bonobos and most buses. Because in bonobo groups, and that's also very essential, the females are the buses. So if they screw up, maybe you think, well, don't worry about it. But, but it's really fun to see in bonobo groups, the power is with the females. And it's not because the females are the strongest, because Jill is at this moment 47. She just got a half year ago uh, her, I think, sixth or seventh baby. Um, but the power in the females is because they connect to each other. They bond to each other. And in this coalition building, they are always stronger as males. So the males are beaten up once a day, so they understand immediately what the position is. Uh, uh, but but that's, that's, I think, a very crucial thing. Uh, how they really bond and bond makes you the strongest. 
There is one other thing maybe interesting about Bernabas. That's in Bernabas, they have what we call fission fusion groups. That means that groups come together, they merge, they have the rituals. Rituals are sex related in Bernabas. And then it is possible they will, that a few weeks later the group splits. Then they meet other groups, they merge again, and split. So they are very flexible social structures. And it's very interesting. We have more species like that. And Bonobos do that with sex, other primates do that in different ways. But they have always rituals to get to quick bonding. And I think if you listen to the lecture, of course you listen to the lecture of Thomas, but that's exactly what he is telling also about. Sitting together, share a few important questions. And to be very honest, I don't think it's interesting what the questions are. What is important is the ritual. And that is what we really sometimes lack. Later on, I will give you a very interesting example. So I have many more colleagues. I won't mention them all. But maybe it's good to explain a little bit why I think it could be interesting for you uh, um, to talk about climate. Because there is a management guru, and I think most of you know him, that's Stephen Covey. And what Stephen Covey says, the essential skill for any leader aiming long-term effectiveness is understanding why people do things. It's always important that you understand why are people acting in a certain way. And understanding the behavior is something we do not want to do. What we want to do is act, act immediately. We see something happening and we want to influence the behavior of people. And what Kofi says, before you start to influence, before you start to act, just lean back a little bit and try to understand what they are doing and why they are doing that. So if people walk to the left side and you want to motivate them to walk to the right side, before you start to tell them walk to the right side, start to understand why they want to walk to the left side. It's something very simple, but also due to time pressure, something I heard already, this is a very complicated thing. And what I want to do today is to show you a little bit, to learn you, teach you a little bit about social behavior in humans. And I want to do that based on primate behavior. And why primate behavior? Primates are social animals, just like we humans are. We always influence each other. We heard it already this morning also. Now, I can take a decision where to hold my keynote today. If I do that in this position, it will get uncomfortable for one of us. And if you have looked closely, you saw already that I had influence on somebody's behavior. I won't stay there, so I keep at least a distance of one arm. So, with my behavior, how I walk around, how I dress up, I have influence on other one's behaviors. Exactly the same as chimpanzees or gorillas or bonobos. Um, we have a long childhood, exactly like in primates. But maybe one of the most important similarities is that we can recognize ourselves in a mirror. And if you put a young chimpanzee boy Dio, one and a half years old. He doesn't understand that's me. He kisses, he, 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 he tries to, to invite to play, but his mother, lady, she understands immediately, okay, that's me, just look how I look from down there. Uh, and, and that can be very challenging for a chimpanzee to look at. But it, she knows immediately what a mirror is. And recognize yourself in a mirror. That's something a few primates can do. Uh, uh, this is, uh, chimpanzees are capable to recognize themselves, bonobos, orangutans, but also dolphins and elephants can recognize themselves. And that's where all the problems start. Because if you can recognize yourself in a mirror, you can put yourself in the perspective of others. And that's where all the lying and manipulation starts. So, yeah, yeah. if you can identify yourself, that's the problem. Because if you can put yourself in a perspective of the other, you can look at yourself and think, okay, how are others going to react? And for example, a chimpanzee who recognizes himself in a mirror is a very dangerous animal. Because a chimpanzee can be very friendly. He starts to groom himself. Says, Come a little bit more near to me, and if you are on one arm length, they grab your hands, bite in your fingers, and tell you who the boss is. 
My professor always said, if you come into a zoo and you want to recognize who the keeper of the chimps is, you only have to watch the fingers. If they miss fingers, they work with the chimpanzees. And unfortunately, we have in Europe, every year, two or three of these incidents where keepers lose their fingers. And these are your colleagues. These are the people in your project teams. Uh, they lie, they manipulate, they intimidate, they never give honest feedback. And, and then always people say to me, oh no, I have so kind and gentle colleagues. And that's probably the first lie. Humans are not honest. And typically is, I, one of the research projects I do is bullying, studying bullying behavior in children. And it's funny to sit in a school class, because you sit in a school class, the kids entering in the morning, and I have seen already the teacher. And she really looks ugly that day. I, I, I can't imagine why she should buy a dress like that. It doesn't fit her. It's, she really looks ugly. But I go and tell her, and I say, oh, you look nice, oh, my first wife. And, and, and then the kids enter. And there was always one kid in the classroom that looks to the teacher, and you see him thinking, and he says, you look very ugly. And what happens? These kids, we are going to train into a training course, social behavior shift. And what we teach these kids, not me, but the school is going to teach these kids how to lie and manipulate. So if you expect honest feedback in your organization, forget it. People are not trained to do it. We teach people 40 years to lie, so never expect any honest feedback. I absolutely agree to what Thomas said, don't trust service. The reason is people are not trained to answer service in an honest way. They are always politically in a behavior. And that's why human behavior is so complicated. So I hope you are not going to run away and think this is going to get dangerous. Yes. Um, yeah. Not always. Yeah, yeah, the emotional side can also be manipulation. Yes, sometimes people break. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know people who cry just to manipulate. But what I always also see is the opposite. What many people do is manipulate and lie their intention. So what they are doing is keeping emotions back. And that's also a form of manipulation. I think even that's a more dangerous one. I ask people, people who you look at and go, ah! And pure manipulation, forget about it. But, but you feel it. You sense it. But the most dangerous thing is that people try to hide their weakness. Because in our culture, we are not open for weakness. You are not allowed to say, no, I, I think this is too happy for me. I'm not capable to do it. Or I have personal problems at home with my kids. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm coming to work, but actually emotional, I can't deal with it. Nobody is saying that. No, happy. We are allowed to go to work today. So it's, it's on both sides. So be aware of it. Um, what I want to do is to take you into the examples of a few social structures. And I have to warn you, there is a big difference between primates and youth. And one of the biggest differences is that primates live 24 hours in the same social structure. We humans, we sometimes change from some social structure. We wake up in the morning in our family, then we go to work, we meet colleagues, then we go into our project team, that's another social structure. We have to deal with customers, with stakeholders. The whole day we change social structures. And in every social structure, we can have a different role. And that's something we have to be aware of. That's different with primates. And that's why I also want to show you a few social structures. I start with the gorillas. This was, was Bongo, silverback gorilla slamming on his breast and telling the world, I'm the big leader of the group. No discussion about behavior. And there is only one adult male in the group, and he decides everything until the last detail. Every day he shows up, slams himself up uh, on the breast, and if somebody doesn't listen, you beat them up. Very simply, no discussion. And this is a very comfortable world. Because if somebody has a question, where to go out for looking for food, that's the bus who says we go to the left side. 
and everybody was on the left side. The advantage of this type of buses is that if you ask them something, you always get the right answer. And you, nowadays, it's very modern. If you ask your manager something, then you get a question back. What would you think yourself? Uh, 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 I want an answer, <laughs> not a question back. And, but that's more than uh, uh, leadership uh, theories. And, and, and Umbrella never does that. Never will, uh, if you ask him, where are we going to look for food? Uh, what would you think yourself? <laughs> then he says, go to the left. And if that's the wrong direction, nobody cares about it. Somebody has taken a, dis uh, a decision. So it's a very comfortable situation. And if you observe gorillas, you will see that it's always relaxed, it's always quiet, everybody's sitting on his position. And if there is a conflict between the females, he beats up both females. No discussion. And it's silent. Everybody expects him to do that. It's a very relaxed social structure. <laughs> Sorry? Who cares about happiness? <laughs> yeah. you know, but, but it's a serious answer. Happiness is not important. Low stress is important. You can survive, also for humans, you can survive with, without happiness. But you can't survive with a lot of stress. And, and what we mixed up as humans is that we said, okay, if I'm happy, it's great, the world is great. No. If you have low stress, then is the world great. And that's very complicated to compare, but, but gorilla groups have very low stress. They won't laugh, sometimes there are jokes, they are playing, but low stress is the most important issue in groups. And I can tell you, in organizations also, and that's something, a mistake we make. We say, oh, we are happy and a happy family. What people complain about is the stress, pressure, a lot of workload side pressure, but also a lot of ongoing conflicts. That's all stress factors, and if you can reduce them, then people will feel comfortable. So it's a little bit different perspective what we have from, from, from biology. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's indeed, it, I don't know if everybody can hear it, but, but what you say is, it's, a very, it's really a trend. Everybody should be happy, and that's what you ask people. Are you feeling happy? Uh, uh, but what we actually should ask at work is, don't you have stress? Have you stress? Okay. If you have stress, we need to take action. If you are not happy, I don't care as much. That's your own responsibility. Then you do that at home. But if you have a lot of stress, then we have a problem. It's, it's a real, and, and, and stress happiness is here. Stress is here. This is your survival brain. This is your happiness brain. Yes? Could you say that happiness is, is simply a byproduct of achieving a low stress environment where, where things are uh, measurable and, and predictable and calm? I think, I think, a low stress environment is a very important condition for happiness. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not immediately the same, but if you don't have a low stress environment, you, you will have problems with getting happiness. Yeah, and basically what you're saying is that it's a communal responsibility to create a low stress environment yeah. within the project, and then the happiness within that, that's up to you, do your thing, do your yeah. dance, uh, whatever. Yeah. That's, that's, that's important. It's a community uh, 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 responsibility. And also for you as manager, as a project manager. Yeah? Um, I went uh, to a talk on the Prime
if it's, it, it's, it's, it's one of the most basic uh, 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 instincts, low stress uh, uh, helps you to survive. If you have a lot of stress, you're killed. Yeah. yeah, I can kill somebody with stress. You get diseases, you get problems, you stop eating, it's finished. And, and it, it, there's a, it, that physical side of stress also works on, on us. Yeah. If we're on too much of a part of, of stress, our body simply begins to decompose. Yeah. It falls apart. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, it's one of the uh, uh, most problematic issues, I think, in organizations. And, and, and the strange thing and the difficulty with stress is it's very subjective. Because in the Netherlands, and let me be very honest about the Netherlands, I do not have a very high positive impression about our work attitude in the Netherlands. We start to complain if we work 50 hours a week. It's not. We work 50 hours a week. Most of us don't work 50 hours. We work 40 hours and then we get stressed. Uh, 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 and, and we are thinking it's very normal to watch every evening three hours television. That's seven days a week, so it's 20 hours. That's something we easily could work. In other countries, they don't understand our behavior. But at the moment I ask somebody to work 50, 60 hours a week, people get stressed. It's a very subjective uh, 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 experience. Uh, I get stressed when I have to watch television 20 hours a week. <laughs> And, and more and more stress. Yeah. Yeah. How do gorillas deal with the individual uh, that's stress? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. individual that is stress. That's it's 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 it's, it's a group is very careful about that. Because individuals with stress is causing stress in the whole group. The only difference with a gorilla group and a human group is a human doesn't care. Because it's five o'clock, I go home, and I, I, I don't see my stressful colleague anymore. A gorilla, which has a very stressful colleague, does see that colleague 24 hours. So you have to deal with it. And, and that's with all problematic behavior. You always have to deal with that. And, and that's the challenge, of course, also for gorillas and, 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 and or for humans, that we can change. Have you ever seen one? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. The question is if I ever have seen a, 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 a primate, a monkey with a burnout. Yes. But actually, I have seen it only in zoos. And, and the reason for that is because we conditioned their environment, and sometimes we did environmental uh, things which helped the burnout. I, I will give you one example. One of the most dubious things we do in organizations, we have architects building our office spaces. That's stupid, because they don't understand anything about human behavior. Okay, I, I know there are some who understand. I know people who get stressed because they have an open office space. Uh, I know people uh, 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 will get stressed because they have to run for their the, the workspace in the morning because there is only limited space. Uh, I never would do that with primates because we learned already in the 90s that the environment <coughs> we construct has a huge influence on the well-being of these animals. So welfare is extremely important to me, because if I don't have good welfare conditions for a primate, then I have a very extensive veterinarian bill. So yes, I know burnouts, based very simply on, on let me give you, my whole lecture is going to brothers, but don't worry about that. Uh, as long as I can talk. If I need to build a good orangutan enclosure, I build islands with huge walls in between. Why orangutans are extremely solitary? They are social animals, but they love to sit sometimes in their own environment without any colleagues around them. So we build always enclosures where they have the opportunity to sit a few days on their own island. The stupidest thing is, so if you, if you want to have a stressed orangutan, you have just one island, which is big, a lot of square meters, 
but it gets stressed from it because they want to get out of the sound of a racket or, or the other racket things. And the issue is, in an organization, we have gorillas, we have orangutans, we have chimpanzees, but we have only one office concept. That doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. Because the orangutan in your team, he cries out, gets stressed, because he just wants his walls around. So, unfortunately, we have the lesson learned yet. There was one you wanted to comment? There are a few opportunities. <laughs> First opportunity, they are going to avoid the individual. And that doesn't include that they are ignoring the individual, but they are going to avoid conflicts. They are going to build a peaceful surroundings <coughs> around it. Uh, uh, um, they are involving uh, the animal with, with, with social interactions. And, and one of the most relaxing behavior they show is grooming. And in Dutch, lawyer, and grooming behavior releases endorphins in the bloodstream. So it's actually really medical and relaxing. Uh, so stressed individuals are grouped, and sometimes they are grouped that long that they even uh, uh, get from the world because they have so many endorphins in the bloodstream. Primates don't have fleas in the fear. We have a wrong word in, in Dutch for it. Um, so grooming, that's really drinking coffee. Yeah. I, 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 I watch a little bit on five minutes, may I have time? Ten minutes? Ten, oh, then, that's no problem. Uh, <laughs> I, I skip a few things because that's not interesting. Yeah, this, this is interesting, the boot. I like the boots. Uh, and why do I like the boots? Because the boots live in, in, in large groups. And these groups we call harem groups. But you don't see in harem, you see what we call a clan. And a clan is a cooperation of 10, 15, 20 uh, uh, harem groups. And the good thing about these harem groups is that you have always adult males. And these adult males, they have feet, they are sometimes 4 centimeters. They are extremely short. And different as a gorilla group, in harem of a baboon's group, you don't have a leader. You don't have one adult male who is the boss of the group or a female. You have a different structure. And there was a Dutch professor, Professor Proland, he studied baboons in the 70s. And he said, in baboon groups, individuals are the leaders because they have an expertise that is useful at a certain moment. And what we see in baboon groups, if there is any danger, the group is attacked, for example, by lions, then the males start to guide because they start to lead, because they have their huge sharp teeth. Four adult males can kill a lion. They are stronger than any other animal on the savannah. But if the group wakes up in the morning, then you will see that all the old females start to guide the group to the next feeding spot. Because females have more expertise about the surrounding. Very simple, males die around an average age of 15 years. The females get around 25 years. They have 10 years more experience. So leadership is no longer defined as the strongest or the most social, but it's just defined as who has the right expertise at the right moment. And that's how the moon groups function. But important in this time of complex structures without one big leader at the top of the group, includes that you need to have open communication. And open communication in baboon groups, this is, these are gelada baboons, and, and gelada baboons just show what we call lip flipping. And with this lip flipping behavior, they tell the word, okay, take care, we have a discussion. And the good thing is, these are discussions, they take around five to 10 seconds. And after this discussion, they are going to sit down, show each other their back, and they start to groom each other. So what works in this situation is they don't have stress about conflicts because they solve the conflict. They fight, they groom, and the problem is solved. And this complex communication is very important. Otherwise, you have an issue. You can't survive in this complex structure. What I want to explain a little bit is about the complexity in social structures. And, and in humans, we have even more complex structures. 
But we have also a very important management group who said something about these complex behaviors and the differences in social structures. And that was Charles Darwin. And survivors said survival of the fittest. And what Darwin not said is that the strongest is going to survive, but what he said is the one who is going to adapt the best to the changes in the surrounding, these are going to support. And the challenge we have, also in project management, is that the world is changing. It's changing very quickly. There are new impulses coming from the outside world. And your outside world is everything outside of your project. And the question is, how are you going to deal with that? And that's not only a real hardware, it's also a software. What is that doing with behavior? And already Darwin's evolution is not only something that's going on for 10 or 100 or 500 generations. Sometimes evolution on behavior can happen within one generation. And that's a very important issue. How are we going to deal with the challenges in our world? And I want to introduce a few of these challenges to you because I don't think it's interesting for me to explain to you if you should survive like a bonobo or a baboon or a gorilla group. But I want to share a few important challenges with you. It just, I, I, I screw up my whole presentation, but this photo is very interesting. Because these are two adult males, and they had just a conflict. And what they did was after the conflict, chimpanzees always position in a way that they can reach out the hand to the other one, they shake hands, and that's how they solve conflict. They do that always. Within one hour, you always see adult males doing that. This is Socrates and Dongo. They did this after a conflict, and that's funny what happened. Because first they shake hands, walk around the stone, grab each other in the balls, and then they start to group. And the balls sound a little bit strange, probably, but it's their weakest spot. So if you are open to show your weakness and approach each other, then you are really getting together. And then they start to do not do that at a work for people who are like, right, we have a couple of walk. I want to show you uh, 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 two of the experiments we are doing, and hopefully that they will explain a few things about these soft skills and also the human factor. Uh, because I think some of you will, will uh, experience them sometimes. What we did was an experiment with orangutans. We did it also with chimpanzees and we are now preparing it with gorillas. And we call it out of the box. Actually, what we have is a black box. And a black box is just a wooden box uh, with very strong rubber in front of it. You can't look into it, but you can reach into it. It's not simple, but you can do it. And what we do is figuring out who are the individuals who are, going, are curious enough and uh, uh, courageous enough to reach into the box. And what we see is that the adult orangutans are avoiding the box. Shubi, the adult male, is just walking around and sitting in front of her with his back to the box. He completely ignores it. And then you see that all the teenagers, they are trying. They are reaching out figuring out and finally one of the teacher, uh, teenagers reach in and he finds a very small bush monkey. Every time we do this experiment, same result, adults ignore the box. And some people say that's because teenagers have a very different awareness about danger as adults. That's not true. Teenagers have exactly the same awareness about danger as adults. But what happens, adults are very afraid of losing. Our biggest fear is losing. And what can an adult orangutan lose with reaching into the box? He can lose status. He can lose his position. He never knows what inside is it. And so he avoids everything that is new because he wants to keep up appearances. And that's exactly also what happens in organizations. If you are changing things, if you come up with new things, people never question you, okay, what is happening with the new thing? Everything new is great, fantastic. But the first question they will ask you, what is happening with my old privileges? What is happening with my old system? What is happening with my old computer? What is happening with my desk? Where can I leave my files? 
always danger or fear for losing. And I compare it sometimes to a behavior of, of babies. These are Barbary macaques, and they have a baby. And that baby they are showing around and showing to everybody. And everybody is saying, you're so important with your baby. But the problem is, if you want to have status with a baby, it can happen that you don't have a baby. Don't worry. You are allowed to kidnap them. You can grab anywhere a baby, even if it's not your own baby. You can carry them around, and everybody says, oh, you're so important with your baby. And, and, and this it looks a little bit like this. Is that you see a young female has kidnapped the baby, and everybody says, oh, you are so important with your baby. And, and, and the fun with this is that at the moment I studied biology, nobody was writing about this behavior. Nobody, sorry, I was in front of, that was mom who was coming to pull back the baby. Nobody told about this behavior. And then I came back into the zoo after I had worked 10 years for an insurance company, and my colleagues said, look, babies, and they are status symbols, and if you have a baby, you are very important. And I thought, I recognize this behavior. That was where I was dealing with every day in this insurance company. People had a baby and said, look at my baby, I'm very important. And, 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 and sometimes the baby was a staple machine. And, and that was a little bit bigger staple machine as other staple machines, and people uh, did a sticker on it and said, don't take it, it's mine. And when it had gone, we had to shut down the company because we had to find a staple machine because it was a baby. Sometimes it was a company. But sometimes it was also a project. Sometimes it was a software uh, uh, application where people say, no, 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 don't touch it. Or authorizations. So what I heard, is that you're also going to look into the mirror because it's something we can do. And looking in the mirror is very crucial. So I hope I took you a little bit into my world today. And one of the things I sometimes say, our challenges are not systems, are not regulations, are not procedures. Our challenges are human behavior. So I hope when you want to do something with human behavior, you're not going to start procedures, regulations, or systems, but you start to discuss the behavior. I wish you a lot of success today during the summit and a lot of inspiration, of course. Thank you. I feel very inclined to start knocking on my chest right now. <laughs>